So we are finishing today a series that we've done the entire month called His Story. And uh, I tried to give um, uh, what, 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 when you would you'd go check these books out in college and they'd give you the little cliff notes. I, I tried to give the jail the cliff notes of the whole month, you know, in one. It's just like, man, we started, if you remember, at the beginning of the month, um, and I told you about all the prophecies. How many prophecies are there in the Old Testament of Jesus that he would fulfill? There's 365. And, I mean, think about it, one for every day of the year. And yet, Jesus came, um, planned by God before the earth even began, uh, to, to come to be born in human form to die. Yet born with free will <laughs> to die, willingly, but also to fulfill all 365 of God's commands over his life. And I, I compared that to Mary and Joseph because Joseph saw an angel in a dream who said, don't be afraid to take Mary with you, even though um, you are married to her, because in their culture, you signed the marriage agreement before you got married. In fact, typically, it was over a year before, and you would go and build a room under your father's house, and that's where you'd live the first year. Um, it's what they did to protect the sacredness of marriage, to give you a head start on having a good relationship. And until dad said the house or the room was ready, you couldn't go and marry. So your wife had to be ready. And Matthew chapter 25 talks about the ten virgins, the five wise ones who kept oil in their lamp, they kept the wicks trimmed, they kept holy and pure and righteous and waiting for the bridegroom to come. And all of these things were a part of history so that when Jesus came, he stepped into the very history of that culture. And that's why, I mean, so specifically, history is his story. It's the story of Jesus. So God, the creator of the universe, and, you know, I, I used the example of a chessboard. And that actually came to me in the middle of that sermon as I was trying to, it's like, God, how do we explain that you put in place 365 moves and you begin to have them prophesied to the, to, the, to the Hebrew people as much as a thousand years before Jesus was born to prove that he is the Messiah. And I just, as I was preaching, I just saw the chessboard, and it was like a chess master planning 365 moves in advance and how the black king, Satan, thought that he had won. <laughs> but Jesus, had, you know, he was planned to be the white king, and God had planned it from the very beginning, and that 365th move, you know, he, he wins, and we all win. And just the, the importance of the fact that Jesus is the centerpiece of all of history, the BC, the AD, um, the world computer in Brussels, Belgium in 1973 called the Beast. And within the first few years, they were trying to calibrate that first world computer, which, by the way, many world businesses still send their employee data there. And if you are a business that has that, you know because you have a business ID number, and it ends in 666. And so, I mean, starting in the 70s, there was, for the first time, this correlation with a world computer in 666. I mean, literally scared the hell out of me. I mean, I, I was like, Mom, I need Jesus now. You know, barcodes came. I remember the first time there were barcodes. That's it. The mark of the beast. And we lived in such fear because the beast is in the final book. It's in the story. It's in his story. It's in there. And all of a sudden, there's a computer called the beast. And there's a mark that ends with 666, the mark of the beast. And I mean, as a kid, it was like, hello. But here, Jesus, he's the centerpiece. And what did people start to do in the 70s? when the beast showed up in Brussels, when, when the barcode ended with 666. What, I mean, we started studying that final book, but we stopped looking for who the book was about. Because that final book, who, who's it about? It's a book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the centerpiece of history. Instead, Christians, theologians, started examining the book 
for what? The forerunner, for the Antichrist, for the beast, for the clock. You know, when is it going to happen? And I've watched in my lifetime the church absolutely make fools out of themselves with, you know, 88 reasons why he's coming in 88. Just out of curiosity, how many in this room were not born before 1988? Raise your hand. Come on. I mean, there's several of you that weren't even born then. And there was a book that sold. That guy made a lot of money off a book that was the 88 reasons why Jesus was going to come in 1988. I mean, all these predictions. I remember the man who... uh, drove his semi from the East Coast all the way across the West Coast to go to his church because he had to get there on the day that Jesus was going to return. His family was pretty ticked off. The company he worked for was pretty ticked off. Everything in his truck was spoiled. And that day came and went, and he lost his job, and he lost his family. Um, Probably wasn't too happy with his pastor either. But there was all this focus on the wrong thing. When from the first book to the last book, it's all about Jesus. I mean, he is the centerpiece of history. And so we we get down to this day of his birth. And in Matthew verse 1, 22 through 23, it says, this happens so that what the Lord spoke through his prophet would come true. So Isaiah prophesied almost or over 700 years before Jesus came. He says, listen, a virgin will be pregnant. She will give birth to a son and he will be known as Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God became one of us. Now, how many have heard of Notre Dame? A few of you? Through this whole, I mean, probably from the late 1980s on, it's like the world has used Notre Dame to say, see, prophecy isn't that big of a deal. It's like, really? Even anything that he said that comes true is a big deal. But here is God saying, just out of, you know, as far as you know, how many virgins you know have given birth without ever having sex? That's right. One. And there are so many parts, so many of the 365 prophecies that could and were only fulfilled by Jesus. They all only point to one place, to one person, the Messiah, the Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. It's funny, there was a young man in the jail, and as I would list some of the names off, he was trying to get my attention because he wanted to continue with names of God. And and at one point, I'm like, this is cool. It's like, yeah, he is, you know, this, he is this, he is this. And you just feel the energy from him because he's like, this is who Jesus is. Well, all of those names that were given to the Messiah, to who God would be, all of those were a part of laying the roadmap, the waypoints on the map. We all need waypoints in our life. Now, if you look at it that way, Jesus had 365 that God put into his GPS before he was born to lay out the destiny, the course of his life that would lead him to the cross so he could save us from our sins. And here he is, the Lord, the Word. One of the things I researched, I saw an article, and and today's message is is entitled, that all all things point to Jesus. I mean, all ways point to him. And I I saw this article, and I did some research. I want to be honest with you, I did not read the Koran. But I did go out and read some of the other articles about it and research some of the words. But it was a a young um, Muslim man that was studying under a teacher to learn more about his religion. And he was challenged by a Christian who said, well, how come you don't believe in Jesus? And he goes, well, because we believe in Muhammad. And he goes, well, if you look in the Quran, Jesus is in there 24 times and Muhammad is only in there four times. And he was like, no way. So he went back and read through the Quran, and sure enough, he found Jesus was mentioned in there 24 times and Muhammad four times. And there is even a list of the names that are given to Jesus. Not only that, there's only one woman mentioned in the entire Quran. It's Mary, the mother of Jesus. There's a chapter dedicated to her. In fact, they consider her to be deity, that she never sinned, and that she ascended to heaven without dying. No other woman mentioned in there. And, and of course, this young Muslim was just like... So he went to his teacher and he said... 
as he studied this and all the different names they gave to God, one of which was the Word, he said, well, how is, how is, how is earth, how is the world created? And he says, well, God spoke the Word. And that did it for him. <laughs> and he accepted the Word into his life. And he goes on in his article to say, I don't understand why all Muslims that read the Quran don't accept Jesus. Now, you can imagine the stir that this has caused. I mean, there, for his article, there's, you know, I think 35 I saw articles where they're trying to refute what he says. And, and uh, it, it reminded me of even how Christian theologians will take a word in a text in the original language, and if they don't like the translation, they'll try to say, well, yeah, but it probably is this remotely and obscurely used definition of the word. But the most common one points to Jesus. Always point to Jesus. It says in, in heavens, it says Matthew 2, 1 and 2, Jesus was born in Bethlehem during the reign of King Herod. After Jesus' birth, a group of spiritual priests from the east came to Jerusalem and inquired of the people, where is the child who is the born king of the Jewish people? We observed his star in the sky and we've come to bow before him and worship. The eastern religions, the wise men, the magi who were paid as spiritual consultants to a pagan king, whether he was Babylonian or Mesopotamian, they're not so sure, but they know this, that these people were astrologists, astronomers, and they, they knew history. They were historians, and they were studying the stars throughout their entire rule and reign and their position, looking for the star that would point to the coming king. And they weren't, they weren't Hebrew. So how do we understand the star of Bethlehem? We need to think like the three wise men did, motivated by the star in the east. They, they first traveled to Jerusalem and they told King Herod the prophecy that a new ruler of the people of Israel would be born. <laughs> Put yourself in the shoes of King Herod. What? So what did he do? Put forth a decree that all male babies of the Hebrew culture from two years old and younger be killed Hmm. I remember that happening in history once before. The Pharaoh. And there's so many things like that. What do we call that when you see something in the Old Testament that foreshadows the new one? And it happens over and over and over, and it all points to what? It all points to Jesus. God is so emphatic that Jesus be honored for who he is, that everything points to him, including a star that travels. Now, I've never heard of a star traveling. You know, stargazers. Even um, recently, as recently as what, a week or so ago, a satellite being sent up in California without, you know, they didn't tell the Californians this was happening. You know, not, not to put Californians down, but it just kind of, you know, the image that I was always given of them if you went out on YouTube, you saw all of their videos and pictures of the UFO, right? And if you looked at it and you didn't know a satellite was sent up, you'd go, that, that's um, an unidentified flying object. You know, I can't say who it is or I'd have to kill you, but somebody used to sit in these pews. One of, one of my best friends from years ago that used to sit in these pews, his new job is he works at Area 51. I told my son, and he goes, can we talk to him? <laughs> it's like, I think you'd be disappointed even if he could tell you, all right? But here's this object, and it's moving. What in the world is it, you know? I mean, one of the first um, things I got hit with in school as far as people trying to disprove Jesus and, and, and Christmas is a traveling star, Really? So we look at these magi, these, these astronomers, astrologers, historians, and not only were they looking for it, when they discovered it, they packed up everything. They left their boss, putting their life on the line. They took gifts only that would be given to a king, and they followed it for up to two years 
and it brought him right to Jesus. How can that be? Well, there's two different mathematicians that over the years have studied this. Both of them have an explanation. One is Michael um, Molnar, and he points out that in the East is literally translated in the Greek as a phrase, um, an anatole, which was a technical term used in Greek math, um, with math, mathematical astronomy 2,000 years ago, and it described a very specific incident where planets would, and I don't want to get into all the details, but it is explained in science. And in this case, they feel it was both Mars um, and Jupiter, and how at some points in their rotation, um, they will kind of hide behind the sun, and then they will appear, usually in the early mornings before the sun comes up, and you can actually follow their transition. And they will appear, and they will disappear, and they will reappear. And I remember even as a boy studying how they decided when they, they came across this phenomenon, and they tracked it through history, that I believe the first time that it would have occurred was in Jesus' day. Regardless, the man who put things in place, God, all right, just like I had the vision of the chessboard, um, when I was in, in school in science years ago, before many of you were born, <laughs> One of the things they had us look into was the making of clocks, Swiss clockmakers. And I'll never forget the video where it's like we were able to transcend down into all of the different moving organisms. And how many moving parts were taking place inside of a clock to make them as accurate as they were. And as I was praying about the idea that these planets would have to align just perfectly and, and that it was something that you could study and it would take place maybe twice in history, but the first time would be in that specific time. And those magi, they, they had studied the stars, they had studied history enough to know this is what's happening. In the Greek, um, the word for a planet was a moving star. And so they were looking for this. They saw it and when they did, they said, this is it. So the universe's clock that God set <laughs> at the very beginning had this alarm go off. And these Mesopotamians, these Babylonians, they didn't know what it was. They said, guess what? The king is born. We're loading up. We're getting gifts only worthy of a king and we're going to go and find him they went to Herod and they said, hey, what are you doing? We traveled two years to go and celebrate this king. And he's like, what? They went. And you know what I think is so cool? How did Mary find out that she would be born? She, she was to be born, or to give Jesus, and she, she was going to be made pregnant by the Holy Spirit. It was the angel Gabriel, same one that showed up to Zechariah. And, and then in the dream, Joseph what happened with the Magi when they got done visiting with Jesus? An angel warned them in a dream and said, hey, don't, don't go back by Herod. He's a little ticked off right now. So they left and they went another way. All of the physiological signs, time being put in motion, the universe spinning just so that at that point they could follow this star, these stars aligning, these planets aligning, for two years leading them to Bethlehem. 365 prophecies. Jesus fulfilling all of them. Why? And we want to light the candles and sing and go home and have Christmas dinner and open gifts. So what, what's it all about? What does it point to? What's the meaning of Christmas? What's the significance? And as, as I was in the jail, I had written something totally different. E either way, Jesus is the gift. He is the gift of Christmas. And if we don't understand what that gift is to us, we miss Christmas completely. To a nation that was oppressed and in slavery, Jesus was their hope. He was their joy. He was their salvation. He is ours. 
That's what he is. But, but what hit me as I was going into jail that, that rocked me more than anything is, yeah, I know that what God wants in return for the gift of Jesus is he wants our lives. You know, we know that. But religion tells us that we're supposed to give him is ringing the bell for Salvation Army. It's singing in the choir. It's witnessing to others. It's all the good deeds. But the Bible teaches us that, that those are just like filthy rags. So it's like, okay, God, what are we supposed to bring to you as gifts? And I'm sitting here on my knees yesterday morning praying, and God's like, I'm struggling. I mean, I'm alone at Christmas for the first time. It's like, this is tough. God said, give me your loneliness. I'm like, what kind of gift is that? I'm like, God, there's some hurts. And he says, well, give me the hurts. I'm like, I can't imagine wrapping loneliness in a beautiful package, putting a bow on it, and putting it under a tree. And God says, give me that. Those are the gifts that I want. Your hurt, your pain, your suffering, your depression, your sickness. I'm like, God, that doesn't make any sense. And all of a sudden I realize, yeah, guess what? Most of Christianity doesn't in the flesh. But in the spirit, it does. You see, he died so that we had cast all of our cares upon him. I mean, I've been here, I'm in my 25th year. There are certain things that have just been anchors in those 25 years. And one of them is missing. Lucille. I mean, I grieve that she's not here, but that's really selfish. <laughs> she was 102. She is having the greatest Christmas of her life. <laughs> She's with Jesus. But my sorrow, God wants me to put at his feet as a gift to him. And in exchange, he gives me life. He gives me hope. He gives me peace. And that's Christmas. That's the great exchange of all of history is that God brought eternal life in exchange for everything that we need to be delivered from, that everything we did. I could stand and pray with the man who physically tried to kill the man who raped his daughter. He has the scars to prove it. He's so full of anger. And I'm like, this anger, this hatred, this is the gift. These are the gifts that Jesus wants you to give to him. If we can just grasp that today, we understand the gravity of why Jesus is the centerpiece of all history for all mankind. He's the hope. So I hope in your Christmas celebration, you'll take the time to give him the gifts that he truly died for. You see, if you don't give it to him, you're denying the cross. You're denying his sacrifice. And God's wisdom, the guy that could set in motion the universe so that the planets would align to point to his son being born. That guy, all right, he put in place the sacrifice of his son, Jesus, for you. So to honor him, whatever is hurting you, whatever is binding you today, whatever is keeping you from joy, Jesus took upon himself on that cross for you. And if you don't give it to him, you're denying the greatest gift, the gift Christmas is all about. And his name is Jesus. Worship team, if you'd come. You know, <laughs> this is like giving birth to a baby. I'm just telling you. You plan for months. Okay, fine, women. It's not quite like that. But you plan for months, you get this great idea for a sermon series, you preach it, and it's like in a few moments it's over. You gotta start all over. It's like, man. We got a great one lined up for Easter, by the way. So if you're a C and E, that's a Christmas and Easter, you, you gotta come back and bring your friends. Because this is history, but for Easter we have the masterpiece series. And as much as Jesus is the center. Man, you have a part to play in it.